CataractCoach.com, podcast number eight, Stephen Slade. Steve Slade has been responsible for teaching thousands of ophthalmologists in the USA and beyond how to perform LASIK, including me. Back in the mid to late 1990s when LASIK was just becoming more and more popular and building up momentum, ophthalmologists in the community didn't know how to perform it. So Steve Slade was one of the people, among others, who put on courses every other weekend in countries outside the U.S., but especially in the U.S., different cities every other week. He's probably taught 10,000 ophthalmologists how to perform LASIK. I still remember going to one of his courses when I was a resident, a senior resident, on my own time, just because I knew I had to learn how to perform LASIK. And that was more than 20 years ago. We had a fantastic conversation. He's also been the first to do a lot of things. The first crystal lens implant in the eye, the first to use a femtosecond laser, things of this nature. I think you'll really enjoy his uh, podcast. There's a lot of keen insight and a lot of words of wisdom. There's still so much more we can learn from him. Let's check it out. So guys, welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast. Today I'm talking to Stephen Slade. I first met Steve Slade back in the late 1990s when I was a resident. And a co-resident and I made the trip out to, I think it was Vegas or Phoenix, some big road trip from LA so that we could learn to be LASIK certified. We could learn LASIK because they weren't teaching it in residency programs at the time. And that's where I first met Steve. And so Steve, welcome to our Cataract Coach podcast. What I want uh, to do well, thanks, Uday. Yeah, what I want to do today is pick <clears throat> your brains about everything refractive surgery. <laughs> okay. You got it. But my first question for you is, I mean, obviously you got into refractive surgery when it was brand new. I mean, you are one of the absolute pioneers of not only doing the first LASIK, you and Steve Brandt, but also teaching it. Yeah, you know, I, I it's so much of it was luck, right? And being at the right place in the right time. Um, my residency, believe it or not, um, was doing refractive surgery when I got there because I went to, uh, I did my residency with Herb Kaufman, who was such a giant in cornea. And he was um, at LSU. And when I arrived, I, I had no idea they were doing this. You know, my idea of ophthalmology from medical school was cataracts and glaucoma and all that. And then I arrived, and it was a bit on the side but it was Herb's projects that he was doing myopic keratomalusis. Uh I mean, there was a cryolay there. Uh, Ted Werblin was there and they were developing epikeratoplasty, uh, epikeratophagia. Marguerite McDonald uh, was a fellow when I was a first year and they had probably the first physics laser, I believe. Well, and certainly in the region, I think um, Les Brons and Troquel had the first one. But anyway, so early, oh, and Margaret was head of the first trial. So early eczema laser, myopic keratomalusis, which was the um, start of LASIK. And I mean, they, they had this crazy refractive surgery stuff. And then... Uh, later in my residency, they started doing the PERC trial, which you might remember. PERC study was the sure. study of RK. Yeah. So it was really all there uh, for the taking in oh, my wow. residency. Yeah. So just kind and of I would good go fortune, to, being in the right place at the right time. It was good fortune, totally unexpected, had no idea they were doing all that. And I didn't really understand how unique it was until I would go and talk with other, I'd go to meetings and meet other residents at other programs and, um, you know, ask them, well, how's your Moppet Karen Melusis results? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they like, would what? look at me, <laughs> exactly. And I figured out that I really loved cornea, that I really liked it uh, because uh, Herb, told me that I liked it. That makes it easy. <laughs> now, get, get the distinction there. It was like my mother, she never said, um, you know, you're going to be a doctor. She always said, you want to be a doctor. It was mind <laughs> control every day. And after a while, I would repeat and I would say, yeah, I want to be a doctor. 
Well, Herb was kind of the same way. He said, you like cornea. And I'd go, well, I mean, I'm, it's okay, Herb, but I mean, I'll, I didn't call him Herb. I would say, it's okay, Dr. Coffin, but there's other things that I would, no. You like, you like cornea. cornea. Actually, he's like, I, you, you like cornea. And he offered, um, he offered me a fellowship and a faculty position. That's a, maybe a later story. But the point is that after a while, uh, cornea, which is kind of crazy, right? I mean, two extra years for sure. a piece of tissue the size of your thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> what little kid said, I want to specialize in a thumbnail-sized piece, piece of, tissue. of tissue? Yeah. Nobody. Anyway, so yeah, it was all there. Um, I did get interested in it. Um, you know, and of course, at that point, we didn't actually do myopic keratomolusis. But we got to follow the patients and all that. So, yeah, it was there, and I really enjoyed it and loved it. And so that's why you're doing refractive surgery, not retina surgery. <laughs> what? I said that's why you do refractive surgery and not retina surgery. Wetinal? Ret? ret, ret? Yeah, ret what, what? There's this tissue behind the posterior capsule. It's a, a, a nerve tissue. Never saw it. Never saw it. <laughs> Oh, you're too when fun. I, Uday, I mean, maybe you're a little bit too young, but when I was in residency, the thing that we would do on retinal rotations was they would draw the retina. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, with colored with, pencils. Yes, and you literally had to have a bundle of colored pencils. In your pocket, absolutely. Yes, yes. And that was, of course, you know, upside down and flipped. That was the craziest thing <laughs> I ever did. I mean, I, I hated that. Oh, my God. Anyway. Like, like going back to grade school, drawing pictures. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, if you didn't have a green pencil, you were screwed. I just, ugh. No, no way. No, it wasn't my thing. Yeah, so refractive surgery, I think, really was pioneered in this country by people who are in the non-academic setting, with a few exceptions. Obviously, Herb Coffin, when you guys, that's unusual. Uh, a lot of our character coach listeners are, are they skew younger, usually under age 50. And they may not realize that this did not exist in university settings. Even back for me, in 1998 or whenever I did my first LASIK, I was the first resident to ever do LASIK at UCLA. And it was such a battle to even allow them to do, I, I got to do four eyes. That was a battle. Wow. Well, that was actually amazing that uh, you did that. I mean, good for you. You must have... I don't know how you did it, but that's quite unusual. I mean, <laughs> residents, not only did residents not do it in any program that happened to teach it, very few programs did it. And though certainly a resident would not be doing it. I, I remember just so clearly one of the LASIK courses that you referenced and, you know, I mean, at, at some point those just exploded. But one of the LASIK courses I'll always stick in my mind was at uh, Johns Hopkins. And I was teaching the course and about halfway up the audience, sitting the three of them together were Les Brons, um, Trokel, and Mark Odrich. And, you know, the Vizix triumvirate, sure. if you will. And when I saw the three of them taking the LASIK course, which had been sort of disparaged by academia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, what else is new? <laughs> um, <laughs> but had been disparaged, then I realized that, wow, this is going to catch on. Yeah. So much of what we do, phaco emulsification, uh, refractive IOLs, IOLs, um, so many different, you know, I mean, extra cap. Uh, all refractive surgery, as you said, comes out of non-academics. Academics, wonderful. I, I was full-time academics for a while. I mean, we would be nowhere without it. But it is interesting, to your point, how much of what we do yeah. today comes from uh, the real world. Yeah, you know, for our young listeners who may not understand one of the references you just said, you said just... IOLs in general. There was a time, young doctors, where it was thought that putting any IOL in the eye 
was, quote, a ticking time bomb in the eye. You know, and this was a little bit even before my time, but that's the exact quote. Yeah. We tend to forget IOLs developed in Europe came across, and of course, private guys would go over, um, literally bring some back in their pocket. Smuggling. Y- yes, and do cases. And the, um, the establishment, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, was very much against them. There were Senate, I'm sure you all know this, but they, uh, crea- they stirred up enough trouble to where the Senate, the U.S. Senate, held hearings. Oh, and there was that actor, what's his name? Um... Okay, so the Senate and the Senate hearings were to ban Medicare from paying for intraocular lenses. Wow. They paid for aphakic contact lenses, which were horrible. <laughs> and then, of course, spectacles, which were equally horrible. Anyway, Dick Kratz, from where you are, um, famous cataract surgeon, had the patient Robert Young. And Robert Young played uh, the father in Father Knows Best, which was a you know, family sitcom back sure. then. He also played a doctor, so he was like Walter Cronkite. Raymond Burr, what was, what, what was the doctor? It was a TV show, right? Raymond Burr or something? What was the, what was the name of the TV show he played? No, no, no. Marcus Raymond Welby. Burr was Perry Mar- Mason. Marcus Welby. Marcus MD. Welby, MD, I that's forgot. the one. Yes. So this guy was, he was like Walter Cronkite, I yeah. mean, near godlike. And he went up, and he had had cataract surgery with IOLs by Dick Kratz, went to the Senate hearings, and basically just stood up and said, look, I wouldn't be an actor, I wouldn't be here if I wouldn't have had these devices in my eyes. The hearing pretty much convened right then. And that is how we got IOLs. It's. I'm serious. It's a crazy story, but no, I've heard it before. It, well, you know, I mean, if you think about it, the, um, you know, the the current wisdom fought IOLs. They certainly fought refractive surgery. They Faco. certainly fought. Oh my God! Poor, Faco, poor Kelman. Poor Kelman. You, oh, if you're going to learn Faco. You have to count on ruining 50 eyes. It's oh, a quote. <laughs> I mean, that's, that was the conventional oh, boy. wisdom. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, that's um, IOLs. And then from that point, um, it, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, it's better technology. We went out eventually. Sure. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah, just kept, it just obviously keeps advancing. But, yeah, things we do every day. Hi- uh, refractive lens exchange for hyperope was like forbidden. How would you ever operate oh. on a normal eye? Oh, oh. Or how could you ever cut across the cornea? Oh, for RK, for sure. Or even yeah. LASIK. Oh, well, no, no, no. RK cuts towards yeah. the center, right? Sure. Okay. So the RK surgeons, <laughs> uh, you know, this is sort of a little known story that I never saw coming. We started doing LASIK yeah. with a keratome. And the RK surgeons freaked out and went all, I don't know what's the right word, went all vigilante on us <laughs> and the LASIK people. And, were, and of course, you know, they were together. But say, how can you do something that cuts across the visual axis? So like, like uh, it, two brothers fighting. Yeah. Oh, exactly. It's like two brothers fighting. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, well now, now we're at this point, obviously, where academic centers, essentially everyone has a refractive surgery department. And so it's still, although it's still, even at my program, UCLA, before I retired, I mean, 20 years later, the residents still had to really kind of fight to just get a handful of a few cases. For whatever reason, there was a reluctance to kind of want to teach that in a, in a wider format. So oh. I remember you did these courses. Like I said, I drove out with a co-resident a state or two away just to do your course. But you must have been doing a course every weekend. Like, you must have traveled 50 weeks a year. The courses <clears throat> were um, monumental. I mean, the in scope. Um, 
it was a wonderful opportunity to teach those courses. And not quite 50, but one year we did like 36 weekends. Oh, wow. I was gone 36 weekends. And it was, it was basically work in the office, jump on a plane Friday, come back Sunday. The courses were, I, I'm proud of the courses, I really am. They were, um, the didactic was all day Saturday and then a half day on Sunday. Then, what people forget, you would actually uh, do a wet lab, you would do a mini fellowship and go to somebody and spend a day watching them do live surgery. And then the third part was they would send a super tech out to be with you during surgery yeah. for your first cases. Um, if you think about it, and these were sponsored by Chiron, if you think about it, um, I, I don't know if there are many examples of a surgical technique being introduced that's uh, successfully it, um, by a commercial entity. Um, so, yeah, the, the courses were all-consuming. All con- you know, my dog would bark when I'd come home. <laughs> <laughs> Your dog didn't know who you were. No. Who is this guy? Yeah. But I mean, you, I, I, you literally taught every ophthalmologist I know in refractive surgery. You taught the, you taught the whole country this. In, in fact, the world even. Um, 6,000. Wow, that's amazing. And 6,000 people went through those courses. You know, we still have the records. But, um, and, and as you mentioned, they were also international. Sure. So we would go all over, which, interestingly, afforded me the opportunity, because you'd go, you know, there would be some um, very bright, refractive, aggressive, refractive surgeon somewhere in each country. He would sponsor the course, and so you'd go out, but, um, you know, uh, for example, I uh, did the first LASIK in Japan, the first LASIK in the Philippines, the first LASIK in <laughs> Taiwan, awesome. the first LASIK in Spain. There's so many countries yeah. where we would go do the first course, and we would, you know, get a chance to to do that. No, they they were they were lots of fun. It was a great crew um, because it you know it required um, oh gosh fifteen or twenty people to do yeah. them. Um, but they were, and they started out as ALK courses, if you remember, which was a technique that you would do without a laser. Yeah, automated and lamellar then, keratoplasty. Very good, Uday. And the, you read that in a book, didn't I you? I did. I've never, never, <laughs> never seen one in person, <laughs> obviously never done one. Well, I mean, you know, Moppet keratomalusis was the hardest surgery I ever did, without a doubt. Um, and it just got better from there. Now, okay, so here's a fun fact. With Moppet keratomalusis, um, you know, myself, Lenore Dan, Fred Kremer, um, a lot of us did it. At the end, I was the only one still doing it. Uh, people just said, this is too crazy. But what made it so and, challenging? The keratectomy. Now, you know, you remember the automated keratomes, right. okay? With Moppet keratomalusis, you use the original Baracare manual keratome. Oh, you're so pushing it. So you just, well, you slid it across. Now, the thing with a keratome, because the cornea is under pressure, um, if you go quickly, you cut thinly. Uh-huh. If you go slowly, it cuts more thin. And if you vary the speed, it's- which is almost, yes. And then, of course, it would get stuck. I mean, it was... It was just, um, it was voodoo. I mean, I would literally take my keratome home with me. I never <laughs> left it at the OR. I would, I would wash it. I would put it through the dishwasher. I would scrub it. I mean, I would almost sleep with the thing. <laughs> and you would sit there and you would just endlessly practice passes. But anyway, so that's, so if you had a partial or a suction break, or a irregular care, forget you about opposed, it. right? Yeah, oh, forget about you're it. Just, uh, well, you had to use the eraser procedure, which of course was a penetrating keratoplasty. Yep. So, you know, try explaining that to a patient. But um, so that was 
by far and away the hardest surgery uh, that I ever did. And it just, you know, of course it got much better from that point. Yeah, we just obviously keep advancing. Now, even the advancing to, let's, let's say femtos now to make the flap for LASIK, you were on the forefront oh, of that too. I got to do the first one of those. Oh, sorry. The fun fact, you'll like this as being a Did data guy. Our MKMs, we had 80% Uday that were 2040 or better. Wow. By, do- <laughs> by doing it by hand? <laughs> yeah. That blows my mind. Can you imagine standing up at a meeting wow. today and saying 80% of my patients are 2040 or better? Can you imagine that? What technology is that bad today? I know, but at the time, anyway. at, at the time that's like a near impossibility. That's spectacular. Oh, at the yeah. time, so it was, it was, it was And it was the best we had. Yeah. It was so much better than trying to do, of course, everybody with RK was trying to do the 10s and the 12s with 32 cuts and 2 millimeters. Anyway, it was, it was kind of crazy. Femto... Uh, the same group of people, the Chiron guys, and that was Andy Corley, Randy Alexander, Bill Link, Eric Weinberg. The same guys um, came along and developed a Femto second laser, and we started using that for flaps. And yeah, and I, I got to do the first one of those, but the first ones of those required. Um, near Herculean strength to peel up. They were so oh. bad. You have no idea. Uh, but you could tell it was better. And the patients, the concept to a patient that it was done by a laser. Yeah. I mean, if it's done by a laser, it's done by a laser, right? And, and, so the, and then let's, let's stress on you. Because I remember doing my, my, mechanical microkeratomes. When that keratome goes across the cornea, my heart always skipped a beat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every patient. You're just hopeful Mm. that please let that be a normal flap. Oh, gosh. And then, um, you know, we had the automated uh, microkeratome. And remember, we were doing free caps originally. Yeah. The first lacy should cut it all the way off, take it, flip it upside down, and then laser with uh, with the eczema. And then, you know, we'd actually sew them on. Wow. And then we started doing a flap. hinge yeah. flap. Yeah. It was it was a nice evolution and you know it's it's hard to imagine how successful that it's it's hard to appreciate how successful that operation became. Yeah, it's I mean the results now amazing, right? With yeah. that... how does it get better? And the I don't know. Uh, you tell me well, you you good at this. What's coming in the future for for corneal refractive surgery? <clears throat> well, you know, uh, I think about that, and I really start thinking about that with the latest FDA. Um, you know, why is the FDA moving into informed consent? I don't um, know. I don't, I know. don't either. I, and it's kind of like I'm almost thinking, I thought the Prowl study, LASIK, if you, uh, has had more... FDA trials, more published papers, more patients enrolled in FDA trials than anything else other than cataract surgery in medicine. Wow. It has been it has been studied beyond belief, safer than contact lenses, right? Sure. And the results, as you said, 98, 99%. Okay. I thought. I was stunned when they came up with the Prowl study. I, I, I mean, it's like, but you have all this data. Prowl study came, that's fine, great. So to come back and actually want to demonize the informed consent process, I, I just don't understand it. But on the other hand, um, you know, the FDA is a, and I've worked a lot with the FDA, they're a um, very bright people, um, very well-meaning, and they work really hard. I mean, if anything, they have too much on their plate. Sure. I have enormous respect for the FDA, and maybe they're trying to send us a message. Maybe 
Um, they just don't, um, you know, I, I just, when I think about the future of LASIK, it's too good to just go away. Right. But what, what if the general perception amongst Americans or whoever turns against it? And so when I think about the future of corneal refractive surgery, I'm a little nervous. But when I think about the future of refractive surgery, that's a different story. And I think at some point in the States, we're going to have to undergo a shift. You mentioned um, refractive lens exchanges for hyperopia. I mean, sure. God, blasphemy, right? Yeah. I think that we will be doing, you know, this is no astounding prediction, but those could take a much bigger piece of what we do than they do now. What about smile? Maybe that will take a bigger piece. ICLs, I mean, with the uh, Evo and all, sure. that could take a different piece. So I look at foreign countries where LASIK is the small share and smile is, is the big share. Or Fake IOLs um, is the big share, right. Oh, oh fake IOLs is a big share. Right. Or So I, I'm just thinking that refractive surgery will become less LASIK, not because of the results, but because of the, um, it, it's, it's just, I, I don't know, that the, the winds are, the headwinds, the yeah. winds are against it. Yeah, well, I mean, plus like with faking lenses, you can treat a much higher range. You can treat those minus 15s. And totally. And very nicely and very happy patients. Totally. So. Well, it, it's, it's a lesson don't take a don't push a procedure past its limits. I mean, we learned that in RK. Um, RK was um, thirty two you know, cuts is not really needed, right? 30 oh Jesus! <laughs> Stop at eight or maybe twelve. No, and then they would you know redeepening, and then they would go into small zones. There was some crazy guy in Arizona who did um, God. What did he call it? Um, sensory. RK. Did you ever hear of that? I don't even know what that is. Yeah. Okay. So this was a big refractive surgeon. I won't name his name, but he was a big refractive surgeon, big family, uh, famous guy, famous athlete before he became a doctor. And his concept was that he would stick the knife in at the limbus, start cutting Russian style towards the center, not to a marked zone, but until he felt the cornea release. Oh, wow. I, I don't know if I'd feel anything, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so you would see, and, and you know, some of these zones were like 1.5 millimeters. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, they are crazy looking. Anyway, so stuff don't, like So that. don't be married to a single procedure. Don't oh, take, never. Don't take a procedure never. past its limits. And then basically, never. just be open to the whole class. So refractive surgery now, as we're seeing, remember, I mean, when I was a resident... If I said I wanted to do refractive cataract surgery, I'm worried about my patient's astigmatism. People thought I was crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Have as many tools as you possibly can. In the toolbox. Because yeah. the patients are so different that really what we do these days, it's like picking an IOL, right? I mean, think how much time you try to figure out whether you should use an EDOF or a multifocal yeah. or an adjustable uh, when you're talking to a patient. It, it, it's the same with, you know, you, you just... You need to have almost every option. And that's why in my career, I would always at least try something new uh, to see if I liked it. And, you know, some of them weren't so great, but I would try. And I would, um, it always sort of astounded me when people, the, you know, the community would, um, you know, the common knowledge would rise up against a particular device. And I say, well, wait a minute, we haven't even done this yet. Yeah. You know? And of course, the other thing, just what occurred to me, remember the, one of the cool things about refractive surgery was we got to do it all first in the States, right? <laughs> and everything else we have to wait for the yeah. Europeans to do. Yeah, so I liked sure. that, that, that. Yeah, that was fun. For sure, pushing the envelope. Now, do you think there's a reason why there's not a bigger uptake of refractive surgery? Like in the U.S., let's say you're doing, what, a million LASIK a year, maybe? 
Oh, no, more like about 700,000. But with the number of myopic people, like in the U.S. now, the incidence of myopia is going way, way, way up. If you look at other countries like Singapore or Hong Kong, 80 plus percent of the young people are myopic. So yep. you would think it'd be almost like getting braces, <clears throat> braces on your teeth. You get braces yep. when you're, you're a teenager, so you get straight teeth. And then when you're done growing at, let's say, 22, you get your LASIK done and enjoy your life. Why yeah. isn't that happening? Oh, that's a good question. Um, did you get braces when you were a kid when you wanted to or because your parents wanted you to? Your parents. Yeah, your parents would haul you in. Yep. It's, a great, it's a great analogy. And, uh, but I, I wonder uh, whose parents ever took them to the refractive surgeon to have LASIK. Yeah. Uh, it's just a thought. Um, so why, why don't more people have refractive surgery? And remember, LASIK has stalled out. At one point, we were doing well over a million, and now we literally are doing seven, 800,000 a year. Oh, wow. It's come up a bit. Well, um, part of it <clears throat> was economic. Part of it was the, you know, every few years you get this just crushing um, bad press. Yeah. And <clears throat> which hurts. Um, but why hasn't it just taken over? People, a lot of people say it's fear of having your eyes cut on. Um, a lot of people say it's economic, but my God, there is nothing that is of value. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> right. what, what part of your body do you use every waking moment right. of every single day? Right. I mean, you can get LASIK for less than you can buy a good flat screen. And then, for th the, let's say you have LASIK when you're 22. For the next 30 oh. years, you've got no contacts, no glasses. You have ultimate freedom. You will, you will make money. Right. Yeah. And then, no, by I, the way, I, the braces, I can tell you, uh, are way more got, than LASIK. Yeah. Well, you've got nice teeth. They did a good job. Did you have braces? In fact, I'm I, guessing. Just, I just had a redo of the braces during COVID when I was putting the mask on. <laughs> so that's why they look so good. Oh, I, they look good. I paid I pay uh, again. Oh, well, you know, it, it is a, um, it, 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 it's a puzzle to me, Uday. I don't understand why, uh, I mean, why, I don't understand. Maybe we're not educating the public appropriately. Maybe it's like you say, now that the FDA takes a procedure that's been done in this country for decades, tens of millions of patients have had it done in the U.S. Like you said, the most studied thing other than cataract surgery in the whole body, head to toe. And now you're going back into the consent process? So maybe that's kind of a negative publicity. And I know, there's, you know, every time there's a New York Times article, the number of patients who ask me about it. It just, is, is high. It's terrible. It's incredible. I'm shocked. Oh. Well, and then, you know, you get the, the, the articles, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you get these negative articles and they're, uh, well, Oz, Mehmet Oz had a, um, when he had his, you know, the guy who ran for the Senate, Dr. Oz, he had a, um, uh, one of his TV shows dedicated to LASIK. And it was super negative. Oh, it was boy. just awful. And I remember thinking, uh, this is a physician, bright guy. Yeah. How in the world did he not do his homework and have a better understanding right. than he does? He just, right. uh, it's, um, the, the writers. Okay, so there was a New York Times guy who wrote a very negative article about LASIK saying that, and this was after the femtosecond laser came out for flaps, and he said basically it's all done by computers now and lasers, not even done by the surgeon. And I called the New York Times, and somehow I got through to this guy. Okay, wow. And, and, and he was like, who are you? And I was like, well, I'm Steve Slade, I you know, do LASIK, and I just wanted to ask you, and he goes, why are you, I mean, you know, he was obviously very pissed off at his secretary that I got through. And he, 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 he knew nothing. It, it just, it, it, it was the, the depth of his knowledge about it was like zero. We talked for a little bit. He got really frustrated and said he had to go get a latte or something. I don't know. So, so I guess 
it's, it's clickbait. Sensationalism sells. If you have this article, oh. article about the dangers of laser eye surgery, it'll get a lot of clicks and a lot of advertising. Yep. Whereas if you have, a, right. ha- if you have a happy story of how amazing this procedure is, eh, you'll get a fraction of the clicks. Absolutely. So it's, Absolutely. It's, it's the and we, so people, uh, people say fear is the main reason that they don't get LASIK, and that just feeds into the fear. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's got to be... The fe- negativity. It, it, yeah, like yeah. you said, it's not the cost. You guys should come up ahead. No, no, no. The, it's a bargain. Yeah. As a value proposition, I can't think of a procedure that gives you more for less. I, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that number always surprises me because, like, you look at the IOL side, I mean, it's like patients, now, especially in my practice here in L.A., Refractive cataract surgery is like, that's it. That's not more than 90% of all eyes is some sort of refractive component of cataract surgery. And so that's just, mm-hmm. that's dang near 100% acceptance. Well, and who is really afraid of cataract surgery? And it's really much scarier. It's far more I mean, invasive than this. <laughs> far more. Well, far more invasive and far more final. Yeah. And um, the complications are far way more, more devastating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I told people you. just line up for it, and it's a much harder surgery to teach a resident. Let me tell you, people accept cataract surgery. Yeah, people just haven't quite. Even today, I just don't know if they've really accepted. They're certainly not braces. Certainly, your mama's not going to take you down there and get you LASIK. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. But then again, I, I was a good kid. I listened to my parents' advice. They were like yours. When, like, when I was growing up, my parents said, they're both doctors. They said, when you grow up, son, you can be any kind of doctor you want. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it worked. For, as, four out of four kids, it worked. Oh, my God. As long as you're a doctor, you can be any kind you want. You, you can be any kind of doctor you want. So now I'm trying to tell my kids, hey, listen, you can be any kind of ophthalmologist you want, even that retina stuff. What are we <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not red. But my, I mean, kid, my kid is smart. They, they don't listen to me, so it's, it's, that's, that's no problem. But You know, it, oh, gosh, isn't it, um, you know, to think that you would have that, um, that influence over them is, um, it's is amazing. phenomenal. But so, like, I would think, if I was thinking logically, 20-ish years old, 22, early 20s, you have LASIK done. It cares you're over till you're about 50-ish. Then you become presbyopic, and then you get a nice, beautiful, truly accommodating IOL that's coming down the road sometime soon. And then that's it. That's great vision the rest of your life. You never have to suffer through the cataracts and the this. and That makes I, so it, much sense to me. Yeah. Well, you know, when we do, refract, when we do refractive lens exchanges, uh, when we started doing them, and I would explain it, you know, it's just kind of like early cataract surgery and this and that and that. And I started getting the the common comment, and it was, "You mean I won't have to have cataract surgery when I get old?" Exactly. <laughs> That's the magic. <laughs> and they loved that. Right. They really, really love that. And how much easier is that procedure, and so low risk when the nucleus is relatively soft oh. instead of being a rock? Oh, oh my God! I mean, that ought to it, it, there ought to be a law. Against not having your cataracts done before you're 65 or something. I mean, you know, Wait, I, I, ever, ever, we've all had those 90 year olds where they got the oh, absolute petrified God. rock in there. Oh, and you just say, you know, well, oh, you, you just feel for them because, yeah. oh, why didn't you have this done earlier? Yeah, for sure. For sure. No. So, what do you, uh, you were involved in the combining lens very early, right? The first crystal lens? Which I you think, got to do the first one of those. That's, so yeah. where, where's, where are we going with the combining lens? I have a horse in the race, but I think that's got to be our future. You know, it's interesting. Um, often when I give a talk about lenses in front of a group of surgeons, I'll say, um, what is, who, you know, let's think about the best kind of IOL. Let's think of multifocal, let's think of, um, you know, accommodating, let's think of that. And I would say, what do you think 
you know, what, who do you think is going to, what do you, what would you want in your own eye? Every ophthalmologist says accommodating, of course. course. And then you ask, okay, um, what are you doing most of? And everybody raises up multifocals. Yeah. Yes. Um, Yeah. That's where we're at now. So hopefully we're uh, going to have a good accommodating lens coming soon. I think that's the problem. I did get to do the first um, Chiron, the crystal lens, and that was fun. But um, it it wasn't good enough. It just wasn't good enough. And I know now that there are several ones out there. It's it's obviously a very hard thing to accomplish, mainly because of the uncooperativeness of the the bag, the capsular bag in my opinion. But um, if you get a good accommodating IOL, I think it's game over. I mean, who wouldn't want that? I think the beauty is for our our audience here, there are a lot of good horses in the race and coming at a little differently. I was just actually this last weekend, yesterday I was in New Orleans, the New Orleans Academy of Ophthalmology, which is one of my favorite favorite meetings. My third time there, I will always come back to that meeting. That's an incredible meeting. Oh, cool. It's a good meeting. Oh, it's fantastic. So that meeting... Was it Okay. Well attended? Yeah, oh, it's always well attended. Mm-hmm. And, and it was a, a week before, like, the big Mardi Gras, there were parades going on. And, you know, obviously the food in New Orleans, the culture, and then the, the meeting people. It's just a really collegial, great, big meeting. And I love it. But, yeah, we were talking. I was talking to Gene Dewan, who has his own accommodating lens and development. And his is avoiding the bag completely, going in front of the bag, and directly having a lens that's, you know, pushing out towards, you know, ciliary, ciliary muscle. Whereas I'm working with LensGen with the Juvian Accommodating Lens. I first did that lens. I was the first one to do that, copying you. I did that in 2015 in Panama. That actually is filling the bag completely. And now we even have patients eight years later that, surprise, surprise, this is a zero, knock on wood here, zero PCO rate. And the bag stays open. And so it, there are different approaches. But I think you're right. We're going to get this accomplished. If I told You need someone, to take uh, the bag out of the equation. Right. Gene's lens um, is based on a lens that was from Israel, and I was on the board of that company. And it, it actually it, it it sits in the sulcus or it sits above the bag. bag. Yeah, clever. Uh, the Juvene lens, as you said, fills uh, the bag. It, it fills the bag. No PCO. You know, that that's what you're going to need. You need to take the. I worry when the, you're using a lens that basically depends too much on the bag. Depends on the bag not to um, try healing, try to change. Right, we saw that in crystal lens where you'd have like some Z syndromes or too much contraction or tilt of the optic and it became yep. a lot more... Uh, so we learned, yeah. a, we learned a lot is what I tell you there. Yep, 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 yep. But there's also another interesting piece of history people may not know that back in May of 2000, and, was it five, that Andy Corley and, and crew actually were able to get CMS Center for Medicare Services to allow us to be paid to do presbyopic eye wells? How, that's like a miracle. People, that is so underappreciated, Uday. Uh, I mean, Andy is one of my closest friends. Um, Andy and I flew down to Mexico. You know, he was head of CNC. He flew to Houston and he's wanted me to go down to Mexico and plant these lenses. I had them in my pocket. We carried them in our pocket down there. (laughs) I had no idea what we were doing. But anyway, Andy's monumental contribution um, was getting that, uh, getting that ruling. And it was a lot of work. I mean, it it involved Chris Cox, who was his congressman at the time. Uh, It involved um, multiple trips like 12 trips to CMS. Wow. Uh, it was a, it was, and it, it's really the, the whole reason that he got it accomplished. Medicare, not to go too deeply into it, but Medicare is obligated to pay for cataract surgery. And if you had a Medicare that did not pay for people not to go blind, that doesn't work. Sure. But on the other hand, Medicare, being a zero-sum game, can't afford. They literally can't afford to pay. So what Andy got was the, I'm sure you know this, but the dual aspect rule, which means that the lens, 
can do more than one thing. It can correct aphakia. Right. It's a disc of plastic that corrects aphakia. Great. Medicare will pay for that. But if it adds to your new vi- your near vision, that's a second aspect. Yeah. And just get it. I mean, oh my God. It just people. And you know what? Organized ophthalmology fought him on it. What? That's, yes. That makes no sense. It's only makes going, no it's, sense. That's like, that's biting the hand that's feeding you. The academy fought him tooth and nail when he was trying to do that. Wow. Because they were afraid that um, Medicare would, uh, it would mess up the Medicare payments. Uh, just like IOLs, just like FACO, just like refractive surgery. They literally fought uh, his efforts there. That is so crazy because, I mean, that's obviously helped ca- millions of patients. Millions of patients have an extra huge added benefit. And heck, now we're doing presbyopic lenses with torrent corrections in the works. Yeah. Yeah. This there, is- were, uh, there were uh, multiple um, opinions, essays, um, editorials against that effort. Wow. It, it, it's crazy. But yeah, I, and that was Andy Corley. He led that charge. He did it. And there ought to be a statue to him somewhere. <laughs> no. I mean, there really should. Yeah. There really should be. And people just, people don't know. It was all behind the scenes. It was all done with CMS and Chris Cox and Arnold and Porter, uh, the law firm out of D.C., um, you know, it was just a small team. Uh, myself, uh, Steve Dell, yeah. were involved from the medical side, and um, but I mean, it was that was led by Andy Corley. It was conceived by Andy Corley, and of course, the reason he did it, it was part of his original business plan for Crystal Lens. Yeah, because he's going to do this thing right. Well, how are you going to pay for it? And so that was the thing, develop the lens and then get a way to pay for it. So it was this original plan. But I, I mean, Andy Corley, there should be an Andy Corley day where all, <laughs> we're all it. off the, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. really, we're all ophthalmologists, get a day off and, uh, you know, sit around and talk about Andy Corley. I, I inter- really should. I, I, inter- I introduced my son to Andy Corley at a meeting and I told my son, I was like, and this is the man who made it possible for me to pay for your college education. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I you know, I, it, it, there ought to be, Andy Corley should never have to buy his own meals. He should <laughs> never have to buy his own beer. I mean, there should be people standing in line. Waiting, yeah. Yeah, to, yeah, to buy him a dinner. And even, you know, what we don't talk about is how many patients are so incredibly appreciative that you you oh. I mean you you hear every week you the doctor you I've never seen this well my entire life I can't believe at age seventy or eighty I can see like I did when I was a kid it blows yeah. their mind yeah uh, it, it it's wonderful surgery I mean we are blessed and so lucky to be able to be in this field I you know I think back and you know I really kind of stumbled into ophthalmology. Um, I went through medical school and I didn't like anything. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, and so I literally took a, uh, I did an internship uh-huh. and then I took a year off. Oh, wow. Because I, you know, I mean, every time I'd start a specialty, I'd say, neurosurgery, have an uncle who's, now, this is it, after about two days. OB Gen, <laughs> I was dating a girl whose father was a huge OB Gen in Houston. This is it. And after about a day, I was like, oh, nope, God, not me. no. <laughs> Not me. So I literally got out of medical school. I didn't know what I was going to do. I worked as a carpenter for a year. Wow. And so that orthopedic uh, surgery, basically. Carpentry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought about orthopedics, had a residency lined up in California. Just couldn't quite pull the trigger. And so I went back and I started thinking about the people in my medical school class that I sort of admired. And there was one of them who went into ophthalmology. I couldn't even spell ophthalmology. I always dropped the second, you know, that yeah. tricky second H. But I, um, I, I, you know, 
got a, um, I managed to get a, a, a residency early because, you know, you have to wait a couple sure. of years and all that. But I often, I, I truly believe, no kidding, that if I wouldn't have gotten into ophthalmology, I would have gone to law school or something, oh, God wow. forbid. Wow. I don't think I would have been a doctor. I mean, what, could, what would you be happy doing other than ophthalmology? Mm, not a whole lot. <laughs> not a I whole mean, lot. We are so lucky yeah. to have this field. And people like Andy Corley and all of our friends, you, everybody, we're just so lucky to have this amazing field um, that makes us, our patients, so happy. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm, thank, I'm thankful every day that I'm an ophthalmologist. Every day I'm, I'm absolutely oh, thankful. Oh, oh, oh. So, I mean, it's, no. it's life or death, Uday. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think we, and it's, it's just life or death, you know? The, the, they don't teach it well in medical school. I mean, we had like five days and I cut three of them. Uh, so, <laughs> I think we're on that similar story. You know, I didn't plan on doing it either. And I, yeah. in, in, in med school, the only thing I liked was microsurgery. So whether it was ENT, skull-based surgery, like otology, maybe some neurosurgery. But I, I had three weeks to kill, and I just did, oh, I'll do an ophthalmology rotation. And I was, wow, mind blown. And so in medical school, you spent three weeks on it. Three weeks. Three weeks. I spent two days. Two yeah. days. Well, I, well, it would have been nothing, but I didn't have, I had a, a blank in my rotation schedule, and I needed to fill three weeks. Oh, and my ophthalmology gosh. was open. I said, ah, we'll try it. And then I also realized that obviously the, the, the prettiest surgery in the whole body, the most precise, the cataract surgery I was in love with right as a med student. And then I'm also a math geek. When they start talking about astigmatism, I'm like, oh, that's just addition and subtraction of vectors. I'm like, you got me covered. I, I, I'm in well, love. It, it, it's by far the best surgery, the happiest patients. Yeah. And what I loved about it was that it was so amenable to technology. Yeah, gadgets. I mean, Love gadgets. You know, I mean, I don't know how they're fixing broken bones now, but I bet it's not with lasers or <laughs> ultrasound or artificial yeah. intelligence, you know? Way more gadgets. And then the people. Yeah. That's I've, probably the best I've, part, the collegiality. The, the people are just great. I mean, they're fascinating people in ophthalmology. And, um, you know, the friends you carry through. Yeah, for sure. It's just wonderful. What do you think is coming in our crystal ball? You've been involved in so many firsts, countless, countless trials for FDA trials or new development of devices. What's coming in our future? So we talked a little bit about accommodating lenses, which is my, my big hope, because uh, now that I'm getting up there and becoming presbyopic, what else is coming? What do you think is coming down the road? Um, the, the challenge is what's coming down the road, unfortunately, the challenges are giant. I think the easy fruit has been picked. The mm -hmm. low-hanging fruit has been picked in ophthalmology. You would love, you know, and seriously, back to the retina, um, it would be wonderful to make progress on retinal diseases, but how difficult is that? I mean, just technologically, it's not accessible. It's, yeah. it's, it's cellular. It, it's just genetic. It's so difficult, but I'm hoping, I would hope for progress there. Um, Certainly the accommodating, a good accommodating IOL. Um, I, you know, you, you see refract, corneal refractive surgery options. Uh, there's been so many, you know, like injecting a gel under the epithelium or that crazy Lasek stuff. I mean, you know, it, it, there's just, you know, you wonder what are you people thinking? You, we don't need that. So um, I guess... I guess in our field, a good accommodating IOL, no doubt, is the future. I guess in ophthalmology in general, it's, um, you know, help those retina guys, help those retina patients. Sure. Uh, but, I, I mean, what, what low-hanging fruit is there in retina? Oh, it's a tough one. That's a, it yeah. is a tough one. I mean, that's going to be solved. The one thing... Um, or well, one thing amongst many that I love about um, ophthalmology is that so much of it, I mean, Kelman invented FACO as a private practice doc, right? That's wild. Um, to think about that, it's wild. 
it, RK was developed the same way. Yeah. LASIK was essentially developed in, um, you know, the 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 jung by Barakir, the genius yeah. in the jungles of Colombia, <laughs> if you will. But I mean, so much the the fixes, the solutions were accessible to ordinary geniuses. Yeah. And with retina, the fixes are going to have to come from very well-endowed geniuses, very well-supported geniuses sure. in the Merck labs or the, um, you know, the Novartis labs, things like that. Or, or our, our MD, PhD colleagues. It makes me happy to see all these MD, PhD uh, surgeons going into retina. So they can yeah. combine that yeah. lab research with the surgical and the clinical together. Yeah. It was never Absolutely. me, but I'm, I'm happy for them. I'm, I'm happy yeah. to just stick to the surgical side. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely where it's headed. I think another thing we sometimes forget is that if we did have that beautiful accommodating lens, yeah, patients have LASIK in their 20s. In their 50s, they have an accommodating eye well put in. And Medicare never has to pay for cataract surgery. That's the magic. That saves you billions a year. You're so worried about the cutting our fees. They won't even have, they won't, patients won't go into it. Uday, Uday. <laughs> Calm down, you're being logical. <laughs> <laughs> Just try it. Just try it. No, of, of course. Yeah. Of course. In other words, you have a procedure that people would happily bypass Medicare and pay their own way. Yeah. And, yeah. and think how much they've already saved. How many of your cataract patients are under 65? Every year, more and more. Yes. Every one of those is a Medicare savings. Yeah. There, there ought to be a statue to you, Uday. You have saved them so much money. Think about it. Think how much. We, now think the multiplier effect with, um, you know, all of your uh, teaching and all of your activity, how much you've influenced other cataract surgeons. You should get a little cut of their fees, too. Uh, <laughs> no, I do it all for but, free. I'm, 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 I'm uh, but, stupid. But think, think how much the cataracts that are you have influenced Think how much you saved the government. Yeah. And they still are running deficits. <laughs> it's a tough one. I don't have any good answers there. Uh, yeah, that's really far afield. But it is. I mean, it is. Um, we're doing them a big favor. Yeah. Well, I think it's a neat thing. I'm so happy that I ended up doing refractive surgery, kind of a circuitous route, like I told you. I had to do it initially a little bit of being self-taught and had to have faculty members go to bat for me so I could at least do that first LASIK with the old style. Yeah, but, <laughs> I'm happy but I teasing it. it out. Okay, so, you know, you're modest and you say, well, you know, I just kind of fell into it. But teasing it out, you picked that ophthalmology rotation, oh, for sure. the three-week rotation, and then you agitated enough to where, as a resident, you got to go take a LASIK course. And, you know, I can tell you, um, very few residents took the LASIK course. It just wasn't done. Yeah. I mean, almost none. Uh, there was such a low awareness, even, of what LASIK was. It took so long yeah. for programs to start teaching refractive surgery. So I'm impressed that you, um, I don't know what you did, but I'm impressed that you took the LASIK course as a resident. I really am. Yeah, it was, you know, I had a great co-resident with me and we did a little road trip and uh, I think we went in my 16-year-old Volkswagen Jetta that barely made the trip. <laughs> and just You some... drove from California? Yeah, well, I, we just couldn't. Just, you were residents. We're scraping <laughs> by, man. You're lucky we could afford the gas. Forget about getting on a plane. And it was like, I don't remember, I don't remember the media, if it was in Vegas or Phoenix, but it was like, you know, it was a day trip. We could make it in a few hours. So we'll, we'll, we'll just do it. And so I, I would like, you know, okay, so that would be good. I don't know if they, if Chiron kept those those statistics, but I would say one mm, percent max, two percent were residents or yeah. less out of the six thousand. Oh my God, I'm sure it's less than one percent were residents. But even even now, I mean, would we have all residents for the last twenty years at UCLA, my my home program where I just retired last year? are allowed to do LASIK. They, the, the university will discount it drastically so that you can get patients and do LASIK. Not all residents do it. Which is like, how do you, like, I don't know. Even I don't do any eyelid surgery at all, ever. 
But as a resident, we could like, the faculty would teach you how to do bluffs if you recruited patients. I recruited 45 of them. So it's like, I wanted well, to learn. I wanted to learn everything. I, I remember when I was a resident, I, I did. I wanted to do everything like you just said. We even wanted to do, so it was transitioning from intracaps, if you remember sure. that at all, Cryo to probe. extra caps. Yes. And we were trying our best to get to do, we were looking for intracaps. You know, we were doing extra caps, we were doing FACOs, but we all wanted to try to at least do a few of these things. And I got to do four yeah. um, with a cryoprobe. But it, um, it would be interesting, it would be interesting to see how many residents actually took that course. Um, just complete general unawareness. And when I was at LSU and they were doing MKM and epikeratoplasty. It was sort of in back rooms. Sure. It wasn't something that they were actively promoting. Um, you know, they were doing an epikeratoplasty versus Moppet keratomalusis trial. I mean, where else yeah, were they doing that's, that that's in the United States? Um, yeah, that was a good thing. No, I, th I think refractive surgery is an amazing field. I'm so thankful that we're, we're doing this. And I, I love my kind of my, my summary here, my, my point to end with is that uh, what you said earlier, my favorite thing was that don't be married to one procedure. Don't push a mm. single procedure past the limits, but rather let's yeah. push the whole class of refractive surgery. Keep an open mind to what that is, whether it's corneal based or lenticular based, whether it's fake guy well or it's, you know, I will replace one of the combining lens. And then please, if you're listening to this podcast and you have any involvement with a counting lens company like I do, please get working. I'm getting more presbyopic by the day. And I need a solution. Save us. <laughs> so much. So Save please us. Help me. But I want to thank you. What an incredible podcast. You have so much great stuff to share. I definitely look forward to getting this up on our, on our feed for all our, our, our viewers to enjoy. And uh, I hope to see you very soon in person. Well, th uh, you have been my pleasure, and you know I will just return it. I mean, Uday, you are a force of nature. I cannot believe the content you put out, and I can't, um, it, you know, basically just for the betterment yeah. for our own uh, betterment, which directly flows to our patients. But you know, good for you. You are a force of nature. <laughs> All right, Steve. Thanks, thanks again. again. I really appreciate it. All right, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Uday. Take care. I trust that you really enjoyed that podcast. I certainly did. A lot of great pearls there. So much to learn. And remember, you can download these podcasts to listen to in your car, on your phone, in the gym, when you're exercising. They're on Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, or everywhere else you find your podcasts. Remember, we're doing one every other weekend coming up until about June of 2023. And after that, it's one every single week. Great material. Lots to learn. I'll catch you next time.